Hey guys, how's it going? Today I want to show you these glorious containers and I want to give you 10 tips on how you can have success with your sun-loving annual summer containers. But before we get into the tips, I want to show you some close-ups of these plants and kind of talk through what I used in these containers because they're so beautiful. I'm so happy with them. So first off, as my centerpiece, I have the Toucan Coral Cannas which give us that really tropical, beautiful, bold vibe right in the center. And then I surrounded it with three play in the blue salvias, which naturally want to grow quite large. So they're filling in beautifully. There's one here, here, and then on the back side here, because we do see these containers really from most sides. And then I've got two heated up yellow gallardias, which these have been stunners. And I wish I could have gotten my hands on three for each of the containers, but the two have filled in beautifully. I mean, if you look around this side, look at this just absolutely glorious. So much color, and even when they're out of bloom, this one's out of bloom, they have really interesting seed heads. So it looks beautiful at whatever stage it's in. Then I've got three Supertunia Bordeaux, which is one of my favorite Supertunias. I've got two nasturtiums in here. They're called Whirlybird Rose, I believe. <laughs> I can't remember the name of that one. There's this one, and then this one on this side is huge. Look at that. Look at all of that color and the beautiful leaves. This adds a really neat texture. I've never used nasturtiums in a mixed container and I'm really loving it. And then the last thing I have in here is a Sweet Caroline Red Hawk Ipomoea. So I thought it would be kind of important to put kind of a dark, bold leaf texture toward the front of the containers to kind of ground the whole design. So since these are in full sun, which is one of the reasons why I think they're so happy, we're gonna toss a shade up so that we can sit in the shade and talk about how we get our containers to look like this. I found a stool and I'm all comfy in the shade now, so I wanna share those 10 tips with you. We'll go ahead and put all of the tips on the screen along with time signatures if you wanna go ahead and skip forward to anything. Uh, but we'll just start in with tip number one, which is to choose the right size of container. I think that this is key, especially if you're a beginner. I feel like I've had more success choosing the largest size of containers that I have, I'm able to either purchase at the moment or fit in my space. And the reason for that is the larger size containers have a larger soil reservoir, which means more insulation for your roots. It helps them retain moisture better. It helps um, them retain nutrients better and also helps them keep, keep them cooler. Um, that also goes along with thicker walled containers. I use a lot of concrete around here, which I prefer. I love concrete containers. They are harder to move around and I understand that, um, but they do keep my plants really happy. And I have planted and do still plant in a lot of other different types of containers like galvanized metal, um, hay racks that have a very small reservoir and have cocoa fiber linings where the you know oxygen goes in and out real quick. They have the potential to dry out really fast. And the, the uh, key to keeping plants happy in those kinds of containers is very, very consistent water, which I will talk about later. But I feel like, especially for a beginner, choosing a good size container with thick walls is just really important because your plants have so much more room to spread out, their roots are happier, and then you get performance like this. Tip number two is to use a good quality potting soil, and I cannot stress this one enough. You don't wanna go into the store and buy the cheapest potting soil you can. You absolutely get what you pay for when it comes to potting soil. And I know this is an area where some people feel like they can skimp a little bit, save a little bit of money because they plan on fertilizing anyway, but it makes a huge difference. We've been using the Espoma organic potting soil for many, many years, and we feel like our plants do really well with that type of soil. Certainly there are other good potting soils out there, but you do not want to go out into your garden and dig up garden soil and put it in your containers. I think that's kind of a newbie thing. A lot of us gardeners, like I think I did that in the very beginning, I tried that. It doesn't work. Soil from the garden does not act the same in containers as it does out in your landscape. I don't know what the difference is. The soil structure is way different, but you put it in a container and start watering it and it gets really heavy, it compacts, and it can suffocate the roots of your plants. The third tip is to add a starter fertilizer to your potting soil. Now you might be buying your potting soil and seeing on the bag that it can feed plants for up to six months, yada yada. It may start with some good things in the soil, but we are hitting these containers with water every single day. Some containers get water twice a day and you see all the water coming out the bottom of containers. So nutrients are just leaching out of these containers because we're hitting them so hard with water. So starting by putting in a good starter fertilizer that's a slow feed is a really good idea. I've used a couple of different kinds. In these containers, I use the Espoma Biotone Starter Fertilizer. I've been using that in a lot of my containers this year with 
amazing results. I've also used the Proven Winners Continuous Release Plant Food. Uh, we use those in the big 14 containers along the east side of our property and those are also looking really beautiful. But I feel like adding that into the soil so that you know your soil is just charged up for these plants is a good idea. And also having that on board, if you accidentally miss a weekly, weekly fertilizer application, it's not as big of a deal because you know that there's still some nutrients in that pot that the plants can feed on. And my last thought on that tip is to read the instructions on the bag or the container and use what they recommend. Using more fertilizer does not equal bigger blooms or more blooms. More fertilizer or too much can be a bad thing, so you do wanna make sure to follow the instructions. The fourth tip is to choose the best kind of plants. And I know that probably seems fairly ambiguous, especially to new gardeners, but I think it takes a couple of different things. Some research, which you're already doing because you're watching this video, and some trial and error, which can become a little bit of expensive. It's a really fun thing to do, but if you err a little bit more on the research side of things, it might save you a little bit of money in the long run. Um, but not all plants are created equal either. There's a lot of new breeding going on. I mean, you guys know we work with Proven Winners a lot, and they are constantly improving their varieties of plants, and they just do really well for us. I'm a huge believer. I mean, most everything except for the nasturtium in this container are Proven Winners plants. Now, they're certainly not the only company putting out good plants, but I just really stand behind them because they do so well for us. And I mean, proof is in the pudding here. You can see how well these plants are doing in the full sun, in high desert. They look phenomenal. So you might be down at the garden center looking at this six pack of petunias that maybe cost $3. And then you've got a super tunia sitting next to it. Super tunia vista bubblegum, say, that costs $5. And you're thinking, well, I could spend $3 and get six plants or $5 and get one plant. Well, that Super Tunia Vista bubblegum will get maybe five or six times bigger than those six little seed petunias in that six pack will get. Um, so those are kind of the differences. Some of these plants have been bred over the years to become more uh, resistant to disease insect drought. They have been bred to grow way bigger, produce more blooms and last way longer throughout the season. So those are some of the things like the pros and cons of using some of the older varieties versus some of the newer varieties and maybe spending a little bit more to have more success in the long run. The fifth tip is to give these sun-loving annuals a lot of sun. It makes a huge difference. When you see a tag that says the plant wants full sun, that means that they want anywhere from six to eight plus hours of sun. Now these containers get sun almost all day long and you can kind of see the difference. I don't have anything that's getting really leggy or stretching out. Because these planters get sun from morning until evening when we don't have a shade up, um, all the plants are getting an equal amount of light and they all perform a lot better. So if you buy full sun plants and you're putting them in a spot that doesn't quite get the right amount of light, you just won't get the right kind of performance out of them. Tip number six is to provide these containers with consistent water. If you have the ability to set up your containers on a drip system, do that. I cannot stress how much better our containers have performed since we've set them up, almost all of them, on a drip system. If you've never set them up on drip, we have several videos about that. We'll uh, put a link down below. I would recommend getting the WaterWise kit. That's what I started with. We'll link that down below. It has everything that you need to set up your containers, including all the hose attachments and all of that. And there's a picture diagram that's super helpful to show you the whole configuration. But what it does is it gives you the ability to a little bit be hands-off which makes you like your containers more, <laughs> honestly. I love my containers now that I don't have to water them all the time, every single day be out here. And the plants thrive on that consistency of watering, being watered at the same time of day, every day, getting the exact same amount of water every day. And drip systems are really easy to adjust as well. If you've got a timer, you can set how long you want the water to run and what time of day. If you have hanging baskets set up on a drip, you can have them water twice a day when it's really, really hot outside super important and that way you can also leave for a weekend and your pots will be fine. If you don't have the ability to set your containers up on drip, there are some self-watering container options that are really good and they will save you some time as well. So uh, the ones we've had success with are the Crescent True Drops, the uh, Earth Planters and Aquapots from Proven Winners, which we're trying out this year. So far so good with those. Um, and what those have is a reservoir at the bottom of the container that holds quite a bit of water that the plants can draw from. And in the hottest part of the summer here in the high desert, we have to fill our reservoirs about every five to seven days, but think about how much time that saves you every day when you get to skip five to seven days of watering and you just go out once with a hose and fill up the, 
the reservoir. Now in more mild areas where you get more rainfall, there's more humidity, more cloud cover, you'll probably be able to uh, lengthen the amount of time. You won't have to fill them up as often as we even do. Uh, but they work really well and the plants seem to perform really well with that too. I believe that most people think watering in the morning is the best and that probably is a really good time of day because you're charging up the container with water to get them through the hottest part of the day. Ours water at various times of the day because we've got containers everywhere around our property. So like this one on this side gets watered at noon, the other one gets watered at five. I think the most important thing is to choose a time and to stick with it so that you're not accidentally um, putting too many hours between watering because you might say, well, I watered in the morning this day and I still watered the next day, but it was in the evening. So that's way too many hours between watering, even though you watered every day, you're not watering them like you're giving them too much time between waterings to where they have a chance to dry out and that's not good. The seventh tip is to fertilize your containers consistently. This is super important. Even though we've already added our starter fertilizer in, we have fresh soil, these plants are bred to perform but they need a lot of food to do it. And we don't want our plants to lull ever. You know, we've gone through the effort of buying these plants, planting them up. Uh, watering them and tending to them. We want them to look full and beautiful for the whole season because a lot of us, like we only have a few months to enjoy them. You know, we want them to look awesome. Uh, so we use a water soluble plant food. It's a proven winners that has chelated iron in it. So it keeps the plant's leaves looking really nice and dark green once a week. If you've never used a water soluble fertilizer, it's really easy. They usually come in a tub that you scoop out and uh, mix up in a watering can and then you just water overhead. Tip number eight is to keep an eye on your containers for insects. Now, when you're out there fertilizing once a week, it's a really great time to kind of look over your containers and make sure that if you see any insect population starting that you take care of it right away because if you let something take over, it can really decimate your plants and it can take them a while to come back and you, you lose out on that time with your plant looking good. I think the number one thing that most of us deal with are aphids. They're super easy to take care of. I use Rose RX. Honestly, it works great. It comes in, I think it comes in a concentrate, but you also get like a little ready to use spray bottle, which is what I normally have. I just ran out, I need to go get more. Um, but it's super easy spray, it's organic, that you can spray on your uh, containers that have aphids and it takes care of the problem quickly. The other thing that we deal with here in our area, not everybody deals with this, um, but budworms, which attack our supertunias and superbells. They eat the buds, they're little green caterpillars that eat the buds of the plants. And if you get budworms, all of a sudden you'll notice your plants have no blooms on them whatsoever. And then it takes a while because you have to start spraying your plant and then letting your plant recuperate. So you might be two or three weeks without blooms. So we use Thuricide or Captain Jack's, one of those two sprays that take care of budworms once a week as a preventative. We used to wait until the budworms attacked and now we know it's such a prevalent problem that we just start in the first week of May and spray once a week. Um, now the difference between the Thuricide and the Captain Jack's is that Thuricide is a very targeted insecticide and it only affects the budworms. Um, so it's something that you can use that I'm not afraid of it, you know, hurting any honeybees or things like that. The Captain Jack's dead bug is more of a uh, broad spectrum insecticide, it takes care of the budworms. It also takes care of some other insect pests, but you do have to be a little more careful about when you apply that. You would probably want to apply it at dusk uh, when the budworms are starting to come out and the honeybees have gone to bed for the night. Tip number nine is to deadhead if necessary. Now this one kind of goes along with choosing the best kind of plants. If you're choosing plants that do not need to be deadheaded like most everything in this container, then you get to enjoy these planters without having to be out here all the time. We have a lot of containers at our, in our property, probably around 150 this year. If I had to deadhead everything, I would have no time for anything else in my life. So super tunia, super bells, the galardia, all of these things do not need to be de deadheaded in order for them to keep producing. In fact, you don't even see the old blooms because oftentimes what happens like on the super tunias is they flush out with their first you know, layer of blooms. And then as those blooms are starting to wither, it flushes out again with its second growth. And then there's a new layer of blooms on top and it just keeps doing that to where you never really even see the withered up blooms. It's awesome. Now I have 16 of the containers we have do have uh, plants that do need to be deadheaded. Now the cannas is one of them. You don't have to necessarily deadhead them in order for them to keep blooming. They'll still keep blooming, but aesthetically I like the look of them deadheaded. So I see here, right here, I've got to come in and deadhead that one. Because the petals get a little bit spent looking in brown, I like those to be gone. That one's thankfully shrouded by a leaf right now. And then I've got 14 containers that have geraniums in them this year and I do have to deadhead those. So I'm okay using a few things that need that kind of maintenance, but for the most part, I would do research, choose things that do not need to be deadheaded. You will thank me. 
And the very last tip is to give your planters a trim midsummer if needed. It's one of those things that if you don't have your containers in the right amount of sun or they're not getting the right amount of nutrients, your petunias might get a little bit leggy. They might get a little stringy on the ends and you feel like, oh, they're looking scraggly, what should I do? You can tighten up those plants. Like if you have a hanging basket that has long tendrils, you can kind of tighten up those tendrils that are hanging down so that your plant has more energy into producing more thick, dense growth with new blooms. I do find though, if your containers are getting proper uh, fertilizing, proper sun, you won't have to do much of that at all. In fact, these containers, I am not gonna trim. I haven't trimmed them. and I most likely won't need to trim them throughout the whole part of the summer. And that's it, you guys. Those are my top 10 tips for keeping your sun-loving containers looking awesome throughout the summer. I hope that this was helpful to you guys, and we will see you in the next video. Bye.